So most of you know, because I mentioned it last week, I had a birthday this last week. And so I calculated it. And today I am in heaven. If I were in heaven, I would be 25,915,004 years old. Boy, don't I look young. Yeah, don't I look young. Or you can look at it this way. After 25,915,004 years, it would be like I am today. You can either look at it as being all stretched out or all short, and the whole point is in heaven, time is almost of no significance. How many here are clock watchers? I'm a clock watcher. Anybody ever notice that? I'm a clock watcher. And it irritates me when I go over and I blame it on the singing. <laughs> I'm a clock watcher. Do you know what? In heaven, there won't be any clocks. There just won't be. It's just not going to be relevant. <clears throat> we are so preoccupied with right now and what I can cram into it that I often cram God out of it. That's why I like this verse. I need to focus more on the eternal, less on the immediate, because the immediate is just poof, a little puff of smoke. With the temperatures dropping, you see the cars in front of you, their exhaust pipe and that little vapor coming out. In the summertime, it's invisible, but it's just this a little vapor. It appears for a moment, and then whoosh, it's gone away. And the Bible says that's what our life is. It's just, it's just a poof. But eternity is forever and ever and ever. And what seems so important to me right here and now in eternal perspective is really not worth much. So I should focus on the things that really matter, the eternal relationship with Christ, the eternal word, giving praise unto an eternal God. I should preoccupy myself more with what I'm going to be where I'm going to be than I am right now. That brings me to my passage today. We're in 2 Peter. <clears throat> and remember last time, he talking about scoffers. You need to be prepared. Because scoffers are going to come. <clears throat> and they're going to say to you something like, well, where is his coming that he promised? Jesus said he's coming back. Look, here, it's been 2,000 years. And where is he? Where is he? And then we have this little verse that we just memorized. <clears throat> With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. And so we pick up, it says in verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise that he's coming back. He's not slow. Come on, if a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day, he's only been gone two days. Two days. Jesus is coming back. Listen, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. He's patient with you. Now, when we were younger, we sang this little song with our kids. Be patient, be patient, don't be in such a hurry. <laughs> because God, when you get impatient... Uh, you always start to worry. And then it goes on to say, you need to just think about God. God is patient with you. <laughs> and, and that's the bottom line. God, bottom line is, God is patient with us. Listen, he goes on and says, not wanting anyone to perish. If I were to ask you, where does that word perish recur? Somewhere else in the Bible? I got a feeling you'd probably say John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Listen, the Lord is slow. He's been laying these last 2,000 years, two days, for your sake that you would come to repentance so that you too might have eternal life. He's saying not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance, to turn from their wickedness, their way, their sin, and trust in Jesus. God is delaying his coming so that people can get saved. Now, today I want to move. A living faith requires something else. It requires looking forward to the future. You've got to look forward to the future. Because after that ninth verse that we just quoted comes chapter 3, verse 10, 
And, and where we left off last week, we actually quoted this, but I said we're going to pick up here this week, and here we are. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Now notice, he says, the day of the Lord is coming. It's the future. So I got a little graph up there. The day of the Lord is coming. We're living right now in the now, but it's coming. It's coming. It's in the future. And there's this period called the day of the Lord. Now, if you've done any study in the Old Testament, you know the day of the Lord is a special title for a time period, not a single day. In the Hebrew mind, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that when God created, he said it was evening and morning, day 1. You go down a little further, evening and morning, day 2. All the way down, all, all, all six days, evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning, because in the Hebrew concept, a day consisted of darkness in the morning and light in the daytime. So for them, the, the, the day begins like at 6 o'clock in the evening, and then you go through a period of darkness, and then in the morning is the daylight. And so the concept here is evening and morning in the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is going to be a period of darkness. In fact, Isaiah says it's a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time such as it never was. Jesus calls it a tribulation period. And it's followed by, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus telling us that there's going to be this period of tribulation that's followed by a kingdom that comes literally on earth. Now, we often pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. He's talking about that kingdom to come. He says, but the day of the Lord will come. He says, this is going to happen suddenly. All of a sudden, something's going to happen, he says. The day of the Lord will come. You're going to have to put, uh, I'm not clicking and advancing. Something's on top of that. <clears throat> or my battery's out. There we go. It's going to come as a thief. I want to see my thief. The day of the Lord is going to come like a thief. Now, we know from studying the New Testament in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it says there's going to be this sudden event that's going to take place, and no one knows the day nor the time of it. It's called the rapture of the church. The word rapture is not found in the New Testament or in the Old Testament in either the English or the Greek or the Hebrew. It's found in Latin. It simply is the word rapturo, which means to be caught up. And that is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So I'm living in the, this period, and we're waiting for the coming. And the Lord is going to return, and, and he's going to catch up out of this world all the dead in Christ. And those who are alive, they're going to be out of here. Boom, they're going to be gone. They're going to go to be with the Lord. Because the Lord has promised. The Lord has promised. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So right now, I'm living every day, and the Lord is long-suffering. He's waiting for people patiently to come and accept Christ. And when the last person has accepted Jesus, Jesus returns, and he takes us all out of here. If I'm dead, I'll be in the ground, and he's going to resurrect me out of the ground. If I'm alive, he's going to transform my body into a resurrected body. And, and in Thessalonians says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the clouds of the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Ever, ever, ever. So when Jesus actually comes back to the earth after the period of darkness, the tribulation period, at the end of it, he returns to the earth because we're ever with the Lord, we return with him. And while he is ruling on the earth for a thousand years, because that's what Revelation 20 says, six times he reigns 1,000 years for a thousand years, we're there with him, reigning with him. The day of the Lord will come like a thief suddenly. Nobody knows. It could be perhaps today. Wow, wouldn't that be something? Every believer, phew, gone. I wouldn't want to be one left behind. I wouldn't want to be one left behind. 
Listen to what he says next. He says, the heavens will disappear. I think he's talking about the end of the day of the Lord. So after we've been through the tribulation period and the kingdom, he says, then something's going to happen. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed. The word elements is the very basic building block. It is the ABCs. It is what we call today the atomic structure or the subatomic particles. They're going to be destroyed. They're They're going to be released. What happens when you release an atomic bomb? Woo! You get enormous heat so that there's a total meltdown. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Listen, it's, it's going, uh, the elements will be destroyed by fire. Listen, everything in the earth is going to be laid bare. So after the tribulation, after the millennium, God is going to destroy this heaven and earth, and it's the exact same thing that's said in the Revelation. He says, wow, since this is going to happen, God has laid out history before it happens. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, he says, ah, what kind of people ought you to be? Since this is coming, how should you live? We've all used this logic before. You know where we've used it? Christmas. We tell the kids, Santa Claus is coming. You better watch out. You better not shout. You better not pout. You better not cry. Why? Santa Claus is coming. That is supposed to motivate them to good behavior. You know what? They stole that right here from the Bible. (laughs) What what manner of life, what kind of life should you, you be living? What kind of person should you be while we're waiting for all of this to happen? The first thing he says is, we need to be holy. Holy. The word holy just simply means set apart. Set apart. I've told you different illustrations of this, and and, and perhaps one of my favorites is I had holy nuts and bolts in my garage. Remember me telling you that? A can of holy nuts and bolts. And if you had looked at them, you would have thought you should throw those away. Kind of like us. You look at us and you say you should throw them away. But we're a holy people. The Bible tells us over and over, we know Jesus, we're a holy people. These nuts and bolts were in an old coffee can and they were valuable to me, to no one else. Kind of like God looks down at sinners and says, I'm going to save that person. I'm going to make them holy. And, and you see, the word holy means you set them apart from all the rest. And God says, I'm going to set those people apart. They're going to be my holy saints, my believers. And he sets them apart. And I take in all these rusty old bolts and nuts and even some washers and I threw them in this can because I took them off my 1926 Chevrolet off of the fenders as I wanted to then have them sandblasted and restored. So when I put it back together, it looked like brand new. Everybody else would have said, what are you doing with those? Who hangs on to ugly bulls like that? They were set apart from all the others. And if somebody would have touched that can, I said, take your hands off of those. I need those. I want those. Another illustration of holy. Some of you have holy dishes. (laughs) Holy dishes. You put them in a holy cabinet called the china cabinet. You don't use them on every occasion. You just use them on special occasions. And they're set apart from all the rest, from your regular dishes and especially from the paper plates. Because when you're done with the paper plate, you just throw it away. But the holy dishes, those that's china, you treat it very, very, very special. It's set apart from everything else. The Bible says God wants you and me to be holy, to set our part, ourselves apart from the world and be different, be different. He wants us to realize we're special to God. Be special. Out of all the world, he's chosen you to be his people and he's coming back for you. So you need to be holy when he comes. Wow. 
To be holy and godly, that is to be God-like, live like God. You see, you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us holiness and redemption. Or listen to this verse in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, make every effort to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Why? Because Jesus is our holiness. And if I know Jesus, I am holy positionally. But he's saying you want to live holy until Jesus, who is holy, comes back for us. Next, he says, you need to be forward-looking. Forward-looking. As you look forward to, I like those words. Some of you know that when I was 16 years old, I got involved in a little experimentation with sniffing chemicals, and from that situation, I wound up in the hospitals, a hospital, and I was there for like three weeks. Uh, I was unconscious when I arrived at the hospital. I was the only one of the three of us who was still alive. And when they first came around, they told me my two friends had died. Whew. I was there in the hospital for like three weeks. I was learning how to walk again because I, I, I lost all feeling in my left leg. Isn't that great? God brought it all back. And the doctor said, uh, I'll probably never be the same again. Some of you are probably thinking he's not the same. And he said, I'm going to have kidney and internal failures and another, all that. God just directed Because my mom stayed up all night because I didn't show up at home. She stayed up all night praying for me. Praying for me. After that, I had some of that kind of that survivor syndrome. Why me? Why me? And I was at the Temple Baptist Church in Detroit. I went there because I was a teenager and I just wanted to go on my own. No, no, nobody. And I left my own church. I went over to this other church and, and they had a preacher get up and he was preaching and he made reference to this verse. Boom. Forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press toward the, the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Only back in the day, they preached out a King James Version. That's why I had a hard time saying that. Because during the rest of that service, I checked out. I know that happens to you sometime. You check out. I say something and your mind goes somewhere else. You checked out. Well, I checked out. And in my checking out, I just focused on that verse. And I had it memorized by the time the service was over. Forgetting what is behind... And looking forward to what is ahead. That's the key. We've got to be a forward-looking people. Sometimes we get bogged down so much in our past. Paul had a lot to forget. Paul was a failure as a Pharisee. He, instead of accepting Messiah, he was out persecuting those who were following Messiah. He was there holding the coats while they're stoning Stephen to death. He had a lot to forget. But he also had a lot of good things he needed to forget. He was a very self-righteous man. And he could have been proud and arrogant. He said, i got to let that all go too. He had a past to be left behind. And some of us have been churched our whole lives and we're really goody two-shoes. And we got to realize that, listen, being the good person isn't where it's at. It's being a Christian and following Jesus is where it's at. It's not just the sinner you know, who's got these blatant sin. It's the sinner who just has a sin of pride and self-righteousness. He had to let all that go. And he said, forgetting that which is behind and reaching forth unto the future, what is before. He says, I, he, he uses a metaphor of a runner. He's in a race. He says, that, and I press towards the mark or the goal for the prize to hear the high calling of Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. He said, I want to win. I, I want to finish well. And so I'm not turning my eyes to see somebody cheering me on or somebody booing me. He said, I am just focused on the goal. I, I'm focused toward the future. He said, we, to be, we as a people, Peter says, we need to be looking towards the future and not so focused on our past. He says, looking forward to the day of God. Now he changes terms from the day of the Lord is that long period. The darkness of the tribulation, then the light of the millennium. He says, then he adds a new term, the day of God. And I am convinced that the day of God follows the day of the Lord. 
He said, this day brings about the destruction he just talked about. It's at the end of the day of the Lord. He's going to destroy the world and all the elements. He says that day brings about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat from their being released that he already spoke about. This period of time of the day of the Lord of the light, the millennium, is just a taste, a foretaste of spending all eternity with God in the day of God. Where a day with the Lord's like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like a day. Time doesn't even matter. You live forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I could just keep going on saying that. There's no end. There's no end. The next verse, verse 13 says, but in keeping with his promise, you see, he promised he's coming back. We are looking forward to a new heaven. You see, when he destroys this one, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. There would be no fallen condition attached to that. Eternally righteous, holy, just, perfect forever and ever and ever. John in the Revelation 21 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And if you read the rest of that chapter, it's a beautiful description. Heaven is a wonderful place. Wonderful place. As kids, we used to sing a medley of songs, and I know you would like to hear me sing them. Maybe not. There's a line that heaven is better than this. Praise God for joy and bliss. I like Bethany Baptist Church, but heaven is better than this. Isn't that great? Heaven is better than this. Heaven is better than this. The next thing he says, you need to be spotless. While you're waiting and you're looking forward to all that, he says, you want to be, you want to be spotless. And so I got this cleanser here. 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, I name it. He is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. The word forgive means to release. Here's what happens. When I disobey the Lord, I I get guilt attached to my, my soul. I am a guilty soul. And guilt is just a technical term saying, I have an obligation now to satisfy justice. Whoa. So here I am, I'm a Christian and I've sinned and I got this. And and justice needs to be satisfied, but Jesus already paid for it. It's all paid for. And so now I haven't, I don't lose my salvation, but because I'm a child of God, I've disobeyed my father, I've got this, Guilt that I'm out of fellowship, I'm out of step with him. It's like when my son was born into my family and he does something to offend me, I don't kick him out of the family. (laughs) I discipline him to correct him. And if my son says to me, oh, dad, I'm sorry, what I did, it was wrong. Will you forgive me? I release him. I release him. We confess our sins. If we do that, he's faithful and just. He does the just. There's justice here. Because he releases us of our sin. He takes that sin and he places it on Jesus who died for it. It's a beautiful picture. And then he purges us, purifies us, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You see... We walk in the light as he is in the light. He can't walk. You can't have light and darkness. I walk in the light as he is in light. I have fellowship one with another. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Two verses before this, 1 John 1, 7. I have to be spotless. So I should be a person who is constantly in confession, saying, Lord, will you forgive me? I've blown it here. I messed up. I've been proud. I've been angry. Lord, I was spiteful. Lord, I took vengeance. Lord, and the list goes on. You you know what it is. I I don't have to mention yours. 
You know what it is that you say. This is the sin that just so easily besets me. Well, when you trip and you fall, you just get right back up and you say, Lord, I messed up. Will you forgive me? Of course he will. I know what you're thinking. You say, but I come and I say to him, God, here I am again. And the Lord says, what do you mean again? The last time you're with me, I let it go. Put it on Jesus. It's been paid for. It's been paid for. He wants us to be spotless, so we should be a people who are constantly confessing our sins so that he can cleanse us and keep us clean, and we get this new pattern in our lives where we are living a spotless life, and then we turn blameless. Blameless is just, you know, having a handle that somebody can grab, pointing a finger and saying, aha, look what you've done. The Bible tells us Satan is the accuser of the brethren, and he goes into the presence of God, and, and, and he accuses Job, and he accuses you, and he accuses me. And when we messed up, he say, don't do that. Don't do the wrong. He can't blame you. Live blameless. Live blameless. And be at peace with God. Be at peace with God. How am I at peace with God? Well, I confess my sin. He's faithful and just, forgives me of my sin, cleanses me of all unrighteousness, and there I am. I'm at peace with God. And then the peace of God overwhelms me. And I say, wow, I have peace, tranquility in my soul that's brought about by God. And he says, hey, while we're waiting for Jesus to come back, he says, be mindful. Bear in mind our Lord Jesus' patience means salvation. That's what I mentioned at the beginning. He's been delaying for two days or 2,000 years so that people can get saved. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. I don't know if you ever read the book of Romans or Galatians. They're totally about salvation of God. He says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1.16. He said, are you mindful? Keep in mind... While we're here, it's about the salvation of God. God is in the business of saving sinners and saving their lives and saving their lives. Next, he says, be accurate. It's about Paul. He writes the same way in all of his letters about salvation, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Anybody here ever come across that? Whoa, Paul, what are you talking about here? I just don't get it. You're a little deeper than I am on this, right? He said, yeah. Even Peter is saying what God revealed to Paul and he wrote, and in light of Galatians chapter 1, when Paul rebukes Peter, Peter's making a big admission here. I don't always get it, but it's the word of God, because listen to what he says. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable people distort and they twist. Paul is the champion of grace. You're saved by grace and not by works. So some people come along and say, well, listen, if I sin, then God has to be gracious to me. So if I sin all the more, God becomes all the more gracious. So why don't I go out and really sin so God can be gracious and forgive me? And he says, how can you do that? How can you do that? For Christ died for those sins. How can you pile it on him? How can you pile it on him? They're distorting what Paul taught as they do other scriptures. You know, very interesting. Peter here is calling the Apostle Paul's letters scriptures on the same equality with all the Old Testament that Jesus called scriptures, that the letters of the Apostle Paul are the scriptures of God, and he says those who distort the word of God, they do it to their own destruction. And so what he's saying is what he said earlier in Timothy, or Paul said in Timothy, you need to rightly divide the word of truth. You need to get it right. You need to get it right. That's why I put all the verses up on the screen. You can read them. You can see I'm not twisting that. I'm not distorting it. You might say, well, I just take a little different take on that. But uh, you know that I, I'm trying to do the best I can to represent just the word of God. Sometimes it hurts. 
Sometimes it's painful. Sometimes it convicts me right down to my heart and soul. Sometimes it reproves me. Sometimes it's like God hitting me with a two by four. And then there's sometimes I say, God, I, I, I might be hard of hearing, but I'm not deaf. I get it. I get it. Then there's other times it encourages me. It strengthens me. It comforts me. It challenges me. It makes me laugh. It makes me joyful inside. It makes me want to just burst out in praise and singing to God. But you have to accurately study the word until he comes. He goes on, he says, you need to be on guard. Therefore, this whole chapter has been about countering scoffers, false teachers was the previous chapter. This is the scoffers. He said, therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, he's not going to tell you anything new. Be on your guard. Watch out. So that you may not be carried away by the air of lawless men who fall from your secure position. They have departed from the faith. Don't let them pull you down. You stay true to the end. Finish the race. Finish the race. The final one he has here is be growing. But grow in the grace. Grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. You've got to learn how to receive what God is giving you that you don't deserve. And he says, and knowledge. You will not grow in the grace unless you grow in what you know about the word. I'm just telling you right now. You can't grow in grace without understanding the word. You've got to be in the word. The more you know the word, the more you realize God is so gracious to me. You grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And the book is over. All right, so we've been through 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Uh, after the Advent season, we're going to look into the Gospel of Mark. Mark seems to have been the Emmanuelensis, the secretary, the recorder of the book, narrated by Peter. So we'll have finished then when we get through Mark, all of the works of Peter. Think about this, though. Coming to faith is not the end goal. Some people say, well, all that matters to me is that I get saved and I get to heaven by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> That's all that matters. That is not the end goal. He just said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Listen, he says, that is not the, the end goal. It is the beginning of growing and knowing. When you come to faith in Christ... It's not the end, it's the beginning. It's so important. That's the start. Jesus called it a new birth. You get to be born again. You get a fresh start. You grow and you grow in the knowledge of our Lord. You grow in your faith. You grow spiritually. He says you grow, grow, grow until Jesus comes. Because when Jesus comes, I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to be confirmed in absolute holiness. I'm going to have some immediate knowledge. I'm going to know things. Like I'm going to know people I've never met. I'm just going to know who they are. It's really going to be amazing when Jesus comes. He says, but right now, don't view just coming to salvation as the end all. It was just the beginning of great, glorious, abundant life. A living faith, you see. It looks to the future. It looks for the future. And it gets to the point where a person says, I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. I just want to be with Jesus. I just want to go home. We're supposed to look to the future to motivate us right now. Right now. That Jesus is coming back should motivate me to live for him right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we wrap up uh, Second Peter, and he ends on this whole note that Jesus is coming back. And when we're with him, we'll be with him forever. Wherever he goes, we will go. Whatever he does, we'll be there. We will be like the bride to the groom, the wife to the husband for all eternity. 
Lord, perhaps there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus as Savior. They're on the outside looking in. Right now I pray that they would just lift up their heart and say these words, Lord, I want to be on the inside too. I know I'm a sinner and I can't save myself. I acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I put my faith in him as Savior and I make him my Lord. And in doing so, I will follow him. Lord, I know that if anyone calls on the name of the Lord in that way, your word says they will be saved, justified, sanctified, declared to be holy and righteous in your eyes, given the gift of eternal life. Lord, for us who have already done that, we're reassured we have a future in heaven with Christ for all eternity. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to prepare a place for us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Please stand.